Amen. Jesus is awesome and power and glory. And as we continue our sermon on the Mount, Summer on the Mount sermon series, uh, I'm going to keep on saying, because it's so important, Jesus came to show how awesome he was in power and glory. He came to usher in a new kingdom, to bring God's heavenly rule to earth, and he is the king. He's the king. It's what this sermon is is all about, Matthew 5 through 7. He came to reverse the order of things, to, to turn the world system, to turn the religious system even upside down. So to follow Jesus then and to follow Jesus now is going to require us to live in a different direction, to align ourselves with his kingdom values. And I'm telling us again, life in the kingdom, I hope we've seen it these last several weeks, life in the kingdom is going to look so different than anything else the world has ever seen. It's going to be so countercultural. It's not going to look like the world. It's not even going to look like the current religious system that we're involved in today. See, a lot of times we're just doing the whole church thing instead of the Jesus thing this Jesus life. And when we're doing the Jesus life, it's going to look completely different than anything we've ever seen before, than the world has ever seen before. They're going to look at it and they're going to say, what, where, does, where does this coming from? What is the difference, the moral difference, the spiritual difference in this person's life? And they're going to be drawn. They're going to glorify our Father in heaven. You know, if we felt uncomfortable these last few weeks, it's probably because we needed to. And I'm telling you, I've been right there in the same boat with all of us. If we have felt uncomfortable, it's because Jesus is trying to shake things up. He's trying to help us understand things from his perspective. It's actually a positive from the Holy Spirit. So I hope that we are responding to the Spirit as we feel him speaking to us. As I said, this whole sermon is really set in contrast to the religious system of the day, not not just for the first century Jews, but also for us right here in the 21st century. These two chapters have been describing what life in this kingdom that Jesus is ushering in, what it looks like. Not church attendance, not going through the motions, not looking good on the outside, but true righteousness that shows up in real life in the context of our relationships. That's what what true righteousness is. Not, Not just looking good on the outside, right? It is how we are relating. It's rightly relating to God and to others in real life. He's shown us how to forgive, how to handle lust, the importance of keeping our word, how to love even our enemies, how to pray. We looked at that last week. And now in Matthew 6, 19 through 24, Jesus is going to teach us how to have a right view, a right relationship with wealth and possessions. Jesus, not not Don, okay, Jesus is going to talk about money today. And so I'm going to go ahead and apologize to any first-time visitors today. All right, this is not something we preach on all the time. If you're here today, congratulations. About, About once a year... About once a year, we preach on on giving, on stewardship, and that is today. Jesus, in this passage, is going to talk about our wealth and our possessions. But I want you to know if you're still kind of, you don't know if you're really buying into this whole Jesus thing yet. You're here, you're you're interested, uh, maybe you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus yet. I want you just to listen. I want you to listen in on the conversation because these words are actually for Jesus' disciples today, all right? If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a disciple of Jesus, these words are for you. So let's start in verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but... Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart 
will be also. There's that word again, that heart, heart righteousness. That's what this whole sermon has been about. The whole, the whole focus, Jesus' main concern is your heart today. Where's your heart? What are your, what are your true motivations? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Verse 24. No one can serve two masters. I think I, think I can. I'll, I'll volunteer to try. I, I think I can do it. No one, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve, you cannot serve both God and money. Now, besides the kingdom of God, what do you think Jesus talked about most often during his three-year ministry on earth? He had three years here on earth. What do you think he talked about? Besides the kingdom of God, what did he talk about most? Any, any guesses? Well, yeah, what we're talking about today, money, money. So if Jesus talked about this subject so often, why can't we talk about it in this setting? See, a lot of times people get upset when you talk about this in church. We, we, we start to squirm a little bit in our seats. We, we get a little defensive, you know, we start to get a little hot right here around the collar. And I think that that's a pretty good indicator of the power that money has in our lives, if we really are honest with ourselves. Now, I also want to say, I get it. This topic has been completely abused, all right? Abused and abused and used for personal gain. People have stood in pulpits, and you see them on TV, and they try to guilt you, and they try to manipulate you, and they say, if you'll just send me that seed money, right? And that seed is usually around 1000 bucks. If you'll send me your $1,000, man, all your problems are going to be solved. But first, I need your $1,000 so that I can finance my new jet, Okay. Right? We, we've seen the abuses, so I get it. We, we felt that, but that's not what we're talking about today. The crux of the matter, what we're trying to talk about today is Jesus, if Jesus is king, right? He's ushering in a new kingdom. Jesus is king. Does he truly have lordship over all areas of your life? As disciples, his rule, his reign, his kingdom, he's the king. So we need to pay close attention to what he has to say about this subject. So why such an emphasis on money and possessions? It's a, we, we just said it. It's a big part of life, isn't it? It's just, it's just a big part of our life. We work for money. We live for money. We think about money. We wish we had more money. We worry we don't have enough. Money is a big deal. In fact, we just read in Matthew 6, 24, that money is the chief competition. For so many of us, it's the chief competition for our hearts, for our hearts. And remember, that's what Jesus is interested in, your heart. He said, you can't serve both God and money. No one can serve two masters. It can't be done. I, I share this quote every time I preach on this subject, but I'm going to share it again today. This comes from James W. Miller. He said, it's strange that we print in God we trust on the back of his leading competitor. <laughs> right? Let that one kind of sink in for a minute. Do we, do we really trust in God or in the Almighty, or do we trust in that Almighty dollar? That's, that's a question for us today. Now, let's go back to, to the start of this, this section, verses 19 and 20. He's going to give us two commands as we get started in these verses, two commands, they're in the present imperative. What that means is this is continual action in your life. You're going to have to be constantly fighting against this, vigilant in this pursuit, what Jesus is telling us to do. Here's the first command in verse 19. Do not 
store up. There's the first command, do not store up. Now, this next phrase, I want you to underline it. I want you to highlight it because this is the key to everything that we're talking about today. All right? We're going to see that the issue is not really wealth per se, but why we're pursuing it and how we're using it. All right? Wealth, wealth could be a great tool in the kingdom of God. But what if we're not using it for the kingdom of God? We're just hoarding it for ourselves. Why are you pursuing it? How are you using it? So underline that. Do not store it for yourselves, treasures on earth. For yourselves, treasures on earth. Where moths and vermin destroy. Now, I just talked to Meredith the other day. I was looking for a t-shirt and she said, you know, we had a box of your, your t-shirts. Maybe they're up in the attic. And immediately I said, throw them away. Throw those away. You want to know why? Because more than likely the rats have gotten to those t-shirts, right? The vermin have invaded that box of t-shirts that at one point I thought was so valuable, but now they're covered in who knows what up in our attic. So throw them out. They're worthless now. You see what Jesus is saying here? Where we're storing stuff up, we're boxing stuff up, we're hoarding it for ourselves, but moths and vermin are there to destroy it. Thieves could break in any time and steal it. So why, why, why is that our focus? Here's the second command. But store up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. In heaven. I want you to notice in these verses that Jesus is giving us a choice. We, do y'all know in life we always have a choice? That's what free will is. God loves us so much that he gives us a choice. He says, we have a choice. We have a choice regarding what we treasure, what we're going to pursue, what we're going to give our lives to. You choose which treasures you're going to pursue with your short time here on earth. What am, what am I going to pursue? I've only got a little bit of time. What am I going to pursue? You also get to choose where you store up those treasures. And there's only two options, right? Only two options. You choose whether you will pursue earthly temporary treasures or heavenly eternal treasures so it's very plain very clear which choice are you going to make and Jesus says listen to me listen to me I'm, I'm the king I'm I am where wisdom comes from I'm the source of all wisdom do not accumulate stuff for yourselves here on earth don't do it don't do that as my disciples, as my kingdom citizens, stop treasuring earthly treasures. Instead, start focusing on my kingdom. Start treasuring heavenly treasures. You've been blessed to invest in my kingdom, he says. So the first life skill that Jesus wants us to develop is to stop living for just today, right? Isn't that how so many of us live, right? from, from paycheck to paycheck, from day to day, whatever, whatever can bring me happiness? Where, what's, what can make me happy today? What can bring me enjoyment today or next week? Or that's, that's just, we're living for the moment, for today. And Jesus puts this command in the present tense. And so he says, every single day, you need to make this decision, <laughs> right? It's not a one-time decision. You've got to keep resisting. You've got to keep learning, he's asking us actually to stop doing something that by nature we've been doing for most of our lives, right? Isn't this ingrained in us, in our culture, in the world that we live in? Man, just more and more and more, and that's where happiness is, and that's where the good life is. And so what Jesus is telling us goes completely against what is so ingrained in us. That's why every day we've got to fight against this, present tense, present imperative. Why is this teaching so important? Jesus says, because your heart is going to follow what you treasure. That's where your heart's going to end up. Whatever you're pursuing and chasing after, that's where your heart is going to end up, whatever that is. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, where's your heart? Right there with it. There your heart will be also. What we value 
tugs at our mind, doesn't it? It pulls at our emotions. It consumes our time and our energy. We devote ourselves to keeping it, protecting it, increasing it, and enjoying it. And Jesus said, Here, here's the problem. You're not going to desire Jesus and his kingdom if our focus is on all this stuff here, these temporary things right here in front of us on earth, that the world is saying, this is it. This is where happiness is. Go after it. Go after it. Go after it. More, more, more. And it takes our eyes off of what's most important. What you treasure will dictate how you live and the person that you're going to become. That's why this is so important. This is going to determine the person we're going to become. Now, just as a caveat here, I want you to hear me. Jesus says not to store up treasures here on earth, it, not because stuff in itself is bad. All right, Stuff in itself is not the culprit. But it won't last. First of all, it, it's not going to last. Everything in this life wears out, falls apart, slows down, breaks down, loses its worth. It's illogical. It's an empty investment. This earth is not our home. You're not going to get a, a return on what you're investing. Maybe for a few years, oh man, we feel, I, I am going to get that return maybe, but, but just for a little while. And eternity's waiting for you in heaven. Which is the better investment? Jesus wants us to stay focused on the kingdom of God. Doesn't stuff steal our focus so easily? Gosh, it it's so easy for me to get so distracted and start pursuing other things besides God, besides the kingdom. Stuff can steal our focus. The truth is everyone is seeking after some kind of treasure. So where is that? Where is your time, your energy, your focus, your resources, your bank account? Where's all of that pointing to? Where's your heart? Here's a good question for us today. If you saw the way that I lived, not what I profess to believe, okay, because there's a big difference between our words and our actions a lot of times. And that's what Jesus is actually addressing in this sermon. If you saw the way I lived, not what I professed to believe, would you conclude that I treasured God above all else? If you looked at the way I spent my time, my energy, my resources, if you looked at my bank account, if you looked at my life, not what I profess, but at my actions, what would it say about me? See, Jesus is saying we need to be aware. And when awareness comes, when the Spirit gives us that awareness, we need to self-correct right away. This is, this is a daily command, a daily action. Self-correct. I messed up yesterday. I'm going to get back on course today. I'm going to repent, change my mind, and get back on course. Where's your heart? Where's your focus? Is it consumed with our government and political parties, with everything happening right now? Is that all you can think about? That's all you're looking at on TV and you're scrolling, your mind, everything is just focused on the chaos of, of what's happening right now? Maybe it's consumed with stocks and mutual funds and financials. Man, that's every morning, first thing I do, I get up, I got to check, check the stock market. I got to check the stock market. Well, how's my bank account doing? What do you worry about the most? Where are your eyes? Where are your eyes? Jesus talks about our eyes in verses 22 and 23. What gets your attention, your focus, your concentration? Is it the home renovation shows? Is it fashion? Yeah, HGTV. Is it your car? Is it your boat? Is it season tickets? Is it the stock market? Is it your next five-star vacation? Like, where, where are your eyes? The, the, and here's what Jesus is saying. The more that you gaze that direction, it just keeps taking more and more of your heart. The more it gets, another little piece of my heart, the more I'm gazing in that direction. Because that's what I'm treasuring. That's what I'm valuing. And here's what's happening. we not even thinking. We give our attention, our energy, our thoughts, our eyes to so many things, don't we? And these glimpses, these glances are not meaningless. They're not meaningless. They're actually shaping our souls. 
they shape our hearts. That's where our hearts are going. There is a direct correlation between where your eyes are and who you are becoming. So if our eye is bad, guess what happens? Our perspective on life is is dark. It gets skewed. Our priorities are off. So what happens when our priorities are off, when our eye is bad? We start making so many bad decisions, don't we? Because we're just chasing after whatever we think is going to bring us happiness and security. When we see money that way, we make so many bad decisions because we don't see life correctly. Jesus says in Matthew 13, 22, he, he tells a parable. Listen to what he says. He says, the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure, right? How many of y'all are fishermen? The lure, the, the deceitfulness, the seduction of wealth catches us. And so it takes our attention completely off of the word that God is speaking to us truth and he's wanting us to live this way. But all of a sudden it's choked out because I take my eyes off of that and the lure, the seduction of wealth carries me in the opposite direction. And here's the sad part. So no fruit is produced. Man, you, you are on the right track over here. You are hearing the truth. You, you, you receive the seed, the word of God, but you let other stuff crowd it out. I love the way this paraphrase, the Living Bible paraphrase, it says, the cares of this life and the longing for money choke out God's word and he does less and less for God. Because I can't, I can't have it both ways. I can't serve God and money. I'm going to be either focused on one or the other. Why is it so deceitful? Why does this have such a pull on our lives? Because, again, we're bombarded by it, aren't we? On on television, in the movies, in music videos, and in music that we hear, just... That's all it is. It prom- wealth promises power and pleasure and popularity, so we pursue it. But it's lying to us. The seduction is the, the more money we, we chase after, the more empty we feel. Unknowingly, we transfer our hearts, our worship to stuff. Listen to Paul warning Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10. He says, people who want to be rich think that money is the answer to all of their problems fall into all sorts of temptations and traps. They're caught by foolish and harmful desires that drag them down and destroy them. The love of money, verse 10, the love of money, not money itself again, the love of money causes all kinds of trouble. It's the root of all evil. Some people want money so much that they've given up their faith and caused themselves a lot of pain. Have y'all felt the pain of of chasing after this in your life? Pain like mountains of debt and collection calls. They just want, the calls won't stop. Fighting about money, divorcing over money, worrying up at night, worrying about money. That's, see, that's normal for the world, but we're not of this world. We're called to be different. So Jesus says we got to change our focus where our eyes are. Verse 22, when it talks about a healthy eye, that means that I have a fixed and a single devotion. That's what a healthy eye is. One devotion. It's fixed on God, focused on kingdom values. I have one treasure, one kingdom, and one master. So if I want to treasure something different, I've got to put my eyes somewhere different. Verse 24 says, no one can serve Two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve. He doesn't say you cannot have money. He says you cannot serve both God and money. You can't do it at the same time because they're going in opposite directions. According to Jesus, divided allegiance and loyalty is not possible in the kingdom of God. 
of God. He knows that so often attachment to money leads to detachment from God. Louis Giglio in his book, The Air That I Breathe, he says this. He says, everybody has an altar. And every altar has a throne. So how do you know who or what you worship? It's easy, he says. You simply follow the trail of your time, your affection, your energy, your money, and your allegiance. And at the end of that trail, you'll find a throne. And guess what's on it? That's right. What is of highest value to you? Whatever's at the end of that trail is what is of highest value to you. What you really love, what you really worship, your treasure. And the trail never lies. We may say that we value this thing or that thing more than any other, but the volume of our actions speaks louder than our words. That was the phrase that kind of just floored me when I read that. The volume of our actions speaks louder than our words. See, this whole sermon, Jesus is wanting our insides to match our outsides. All right. So if we're saying we treasure him and he's first and he's on the throne, then he's our master. He's what we're pursuing. So I have a question for you. What's on your throne? What's at the end of the trail of your affections? Where are your eyes focused? Who is your master? You can only serve one. Who's your master? We will either, I love this quote I read this week. It said, we will either worship wealth or worship with our wealth. Think about that. We will either worship wealth or we will worship with our wealth. We'll use it for those kingdom purposes. Now, if you feel like we've gotten to this point in, in the message and you feel like, I, I feel like maybe I've been storing up treasure here on earth. That's been my focus. That is my focus right now. How, how do we break from that mold? How do I do something different? How, how do we break from the culture? And the answer to that is one word, generosity. It's generosity. Generosity, we're going to see in just a minute, is the antidote to materialism. Uh, the, the me, me, me. Let's, let's define generosity. What is generosity? It's liberality in giving, willingly sharing, open-handed, not stingy, willingness to do what we can do. Now, I want us to think about this as well. This isn't limited to just what we do with our money, all right? It's also our time, our resources, our talents that we can use to bless others. Listen to Paul's words in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. He says, command, see, why all, the, why all these commands? Because we need to be reminded, don't we? Command, command those who are rich in this present world. We've already had this conversation, right? Well, I'm not rich. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Those who are rich in this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. See, he provides it, and he wants us to enjoy it, but he doesn't want us just to hoard it for ourselves. Verse 18, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Command them to be generous and willing to share. To share. Why that command two times? Because generosity, first of all, is a safeguard, we've already said this, against materialism. It's, it's a safeguard against materialism, against greed and pride and storing up treasure here on earth. Every time we give, we actually break the grip that materialism has in our lives. Because this is, this is what materialism looks like. It's, it's mine, it's me. And every time I give... What happens? My hands open. It breaks that grip that materialism has in our lives. The world measures success, measures life by how much you have, right? Isn't that, isn't that our 
how we differentiate between you and me and everybody else in the world. We look at the way that you dress and we look at the car that you drive and we look at the house that you live in and we look at the career that you have and we look at your bank account. We look at how you go on vacation. Isn't that how we differentiate who's better than other people in the world? Come on, let's be honest. All y'all are like, that, that is, that's the measuring stick. This is how we know who's better than anybody else. By how much you have, material gain, financial prosperity, a successful career, a life packed with leisure and adventure and self-indulgence. If I have more, that automatically makes me better than you. But in the kingdom, God measures success not by how much you have, but by how much you give. How much you give. Service, humility, love, time, generosity. You are, we, we just read this a few weeks ago. You are eternally rewarded by your Father in heaven when you pray and you fast in private. So you don't need to announce it to the world. That time you spend alone with the Father praying and fasting, wow, he looks down, that's the kind of person I want. I'm going to reward my son, my daughter. When you forgive someone, when you love your enemies, when you endure insults and persecution, when you serve the Lord and his people, you're storing up for yourself treasure in heaven. You're giving. You're giving of yourself. But we buy into the lie, don't we? It's so We buy into the lie, the seduction, life. But here's the truth. Life isn't measured in salaries and homes and trips and cars. Our worth isn't tied to our bank account, our education, or our job because life is not about storing up here, stuff here. Life is Christ. To live is Christ, if we are followers of Jesus, if we're his disciples, to live is Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live the life that I now live is by faith in the Son of God. He's my focus. He's the king. 